Good afternoon. Welcome to our luncheon session. If I could have your attention. Please. First up, uh, first up this afternoon to share insights from the audio streaming market growth and evolution and how to engage voters and get turnout with audio. I am pleased to introduce the Vice President at Pandora Media, Sean Duggan. I hear the train come, it's rolling around the bend, and I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, you know, uh, couldn't be more excited that, uh, you know, we're here today in Nashville. This is actually my first time in Nashville. And, uh, you know, it's like here I've worked for a music company for nine years, and I'm like, Finally, I got here. Um, but you know, I was starting to think about the, our presentation today and kind of what we're going to hit on. And I thought about, you know, probably the best thing to start on would be uh, one of my huge uh, inspirations is uh, Johnny Cash. And what I was thinking about, um, you know, when I found out we're coming here, I found out the you know, Johnny Cash Museum's a few blocks away. I actually hit it yesterday. Highly recommend it to anybody who signed up for the tour did not. Um, but uh, I actually have been going through a Johnny Cash uh, revisit at my Pandora stations at the gym. I was listening to a lot of the uh, live in San Quentin and live at Folsom Prism over the last few months while doing abs, um, weirdly enough. Um, but, uh, and I was like, let me just, I'm just out of curiosity. Like, I was like, I'm curious, like, how many stations do we have of Johnny Cash? And I was like, internally, I was like, I guess it'd be a million, maybe two million. And I was delighted when I saw that it was over 11 million Johnny Cash stations on Pandora. And then I asked uh, our data team for some other stats. I'm like, can you give us, like, how, like, how much is that, does that translate? Because a number is hard to get c context of what that means. Basically, uh, last week, 8.4 million uh, spins of Johnny Cash songs. So it made me feel great uh, when I was over at the museum that, you know, this is really the power of Pandora. You think about an artist like Johnny Cash, Icon, definitely, um, but you know he passed about 15 years ago, but is still very much alive, and that's the power of Pandora to connect listeners with it. And obviously, I think we're doing a good job if we're getting these kind of numbers. You know, country on Pandora is a huge category uh, for us. It's actually the number two uh, category in terms of popularity overall on Pandora. Uh, this station, uh, today's country, is our number two station, almost 20 million listeners. So, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, and we've been at these AAPC conferences for now several years, you know, the thing that is really continuing to evolve is that the power of audio to connect with voters, it's, it's enormous. And, you know, the reality is there's companies like Google, Amazon, who are in a really almost a death match right now to control the living room with the Alexa device, Google Home. And, you know, we are in a unique spot. We're actually, it reminds me of when we launched on the iPhone, uh, when I joined the company, and we saw our growth a big day go from, you know, sign up of 10,000 listeners, 20,000 listeners, to all of a sudden the iPhone, 30,000 a day, 40,000 a day. We're seeing that same type of growth with home uh, listening devices, whether that's connected speakers or Alexa. So we really are excited about this next phase of uh, Pandora's growth. And what it really means in to potentially for, you know, for this year is our ability to connect with voters in an environment where, where they're not in front of a screen. You know, so they're you know, out at the barbecue in the backyard, um, thinking about you know, the weekend where they're doing home chores on the road, hitting voters where, we're, where they're not in front of a television or not in an area to show them a, a video ad. You know, the power of audio gets commonly overlooked in the political ad space. And um, if there's a year where we absolutely are seeing the, the growth at, at an absolute peak, it's now. What does that look like on a state-by-state uh, -state basis? Uh, if this thing will go. Let's see. Hold on one second. Can I get a... Let's see here. This thing is not it's changing here, but not up there. All right, time to go extemporaneously. Um, so what's that look like on a state-by-state -state basis? Uh, in Tennessee, 
um, on a monthly basis um, right na here in Nashville, downtown, and um, I think it's Davidson County, I believe it is. Is that right, Davidson? Uh, we have 150,000 um, listeners. Um, in the state, we have 1.3 million. Uh, so when you're talking about scale, you know, for our, our audience, you know, that gives you not only reach, um, but also real engagement. Our average time spent listening on many of our um, states is hovers for voting age population listeners is north of 20 hours uh, a week, or actually 20 hours a month. So what does that mean in terms of opportunity to connect with voters? It gives you a huge opportunity to engage with folks when they're um, also really tuning in. You know, the other opportunity of Pandora is when you're listening to Pandora, you're not doing a lot of other things. You may be like multitasking in terms of walking around the house, driving, but we really have your attention. When you're thinking of an ad environment, we have only two to three minutes of ads per hour. And uh, I was actually talking to my boss, uh, Gabe, over there. And you know, that's still pretty amazing to me. Um, you know, I think about where I came from. Uh, I worked on NPR radio about 15 years ago. That's actually a lower ad load than um, NPR right now. So it's like, it's pretty incredible in terms of premium um, ad environment. And uh, you know, a few takeaways that I wanna leave you with before you uh, get the rest of the, this uh, afternoon's agenda is when you're thinking about trying to connect with the right message at the right time, you know, definitely consider audio because, and engage us. We have a good crew, we have about six people here from Pandora. A lot of you, thank you, we are working with you but uh, we're really bullish on uh, the power of audio and uh, with the way the market's changing and evolving, this is a great year to really ensure that you have audio at, at front and center in terms of your strategy for connecting with voters. So thank you, look forward to hanging out with everybody in Music City and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Sean. A few years ago, we introduced a new feature at this conference called the Shark Tank, and it has proven to be one of our most uh, popular sessions. So I hope you will enjoy our presentation today. Today, we've got four firms here to compete for innovation of the year. To put these innovations on the hot seat is our panel of sharks. Please welcome Michelle Coyle from GSD Strategies, Becky Donatelli from Campaign Solutions, and Brian Franklin from Impact Politics. And as they're coming up, just to make sure we understand the ground rules here, each presenter will have three minutes to present their innovation. If they, we will enforce that three minute limit, and if they go beyond it, they will be asked to stop. Um, and then our sharks ha will have two minutes to throw questions at them. This is a fast-moving format, and hopefully it will be quite provocative. Uh, here for the first time anywhere is the unveiling of new software, a new software platform that empowers political consultants to rethink polling and make more insights-driven decisions. Please welcome David Burrell. Okay, hey everyone. So I'm gonna start off with a story from a few years ago um, when I was running a political consultancy, probably like a lot of y'all, and we did a little bit of everything. And um, one time a client asked us if we did polling, and you know the answer was no, but we told him yes. And <laughs> the good news was, you know, it seemed like a perfect fit for us. You know, we knew how to, we knew what questions we wanted to ask. We know who we wanted to ask the questions to. We definitely knew what to do with the data uh, when we got it back, but. The bad news was the infrastructure necessary to do it right. The people, the processes, the technologies, the partnerships with suppliers necessary to do it right took us years to build. And that's the problem preventing consultants and agencies like a lot of y'all in this room from bringing research in house. And that's the problem that the Insight Suite solves. It collapses five years of how to and in pulling into five simple steps to do scientific research. 
and I'm going to be able to show it to you in the next two minutes. So let's, let's do a poll together here. If you look up at the screen, I think it should be showing here. Okay, let's do a poll here in five steps. So step one, first we need an audience that we're going to start to interview, right? So we're going to do a poll in Florida. We're going to select Congressional District 7, right? And we want to research likely voters. So we'll pick two out of the last three election cycles. Secondly, we've got to know how long the survey is going to be, so we're going to input 18 questions, and we're going to set our quotas. And what this allows us to do is reply back with the cost per interview and feasibility, which means how many completes can we get you from many different modes of research. Modes being IVR to landline, live agent to cell phone, um, and online to panel. So we're going to do 350 completes with live agent to landline. We're going to do 150 of, I'm sorry, IVR to landline, 150 with live agent to cell phone. We're going to approve the order, right? And then we just sit back and relax while our team goes and collects these survey responses. We bring them straight back into the software for you to analyze the results, visually customizing every single thing you see on the screen, um, setting filters, um, and ultimately preparing these reports to be downloaded for your clients into PDFs. Um, <clears throat> these PDFs are white labeled for your company, um, and ultimately, apologies there, yeah, they're white labeled for your clients, um, and getting an account in order to do all these things is free. And not only is it free, but everyone who signs up at this event gets $250 off their first project and gets entered for $5,000. Uh, one person will win $5,000. So that's my pitch. Good timing. I just want to chair where I can put my feet on the ground. <laughs> probably look as ridiculous as I feel. So Mark Melman, are you cringing? No. Oh, there you go. Good. That's a mark of approval. So the analysis part of it. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit more about, you're not writing stock answers that everybody gets the same answer. You're doing analysis for each particular that is poll true. that you're taking. That's correct. So, How deep? You know, um, I mean, you can pretty much do top lines and cross tabs for any question that you ask and do it very easily inside of the software. Additionally, you can apply filters. So if you wanted to take a look at how married women answered a survey, you know, filter out all the men and filter out anyone who wasn't married and provide those type of reports for your clients, the campaign managers, whoever it is who's looking for those insights. And can the, cl and can the client play with the dashboard? Completely. Can they put their own filters on it or do they need to go back to you and rely on you all to? No, we make it easy enough that anyone can apply those filters Any and create idiot as many reports as you need to do very quickly. You don't have to wait for you. Yeah. So are your customers pollsters or are they just general, I mean, are you looking outside of the pollster universe so pollsters, here? yeah, post, pollsters have the back office to do this. Um, you know, they have the expertise in the infrastructure. We're selling to consultants who know what they want to ask and who they want to ask it to, but needed the pulling back office, so to speak, in order to get the job done. And does this cost, research. I mean, it's, it might, may cost less than Mark, but, but is this... Is, Everything is, costs less than Mark. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, does this cost less than your average pollster? It's going to be about 25 to 50 percent less, which enables consultants to add as a service offering and, and improve their service offering with the data. So sorry, go ahead. Talk us through each thing that this replaces in terms of what a traditional pollster would do versus what this can do. Well, well, everything it, I'm it sorry, replaces. Everything it replaces. So I'm um, sure I've answered that question. So uh, right now, it, you know, what pollster is what we're really good at, and I ran a polling company, right, is, is now getting a supply chain. Right? What this does is it brings all the suppliers kind of into one spot, so to speak, so that you can immediately <laughs> quote out projects. Thank you. And get fees, yeah, sorry. As you can see, we ruthlessly apply the time limits here. <clears throat> Next up, find out how to combine technology with creativity to deliver beautiful targeted ads to your current and future supporters. Please welcome Joe Camacho. Good afternoon. So how well are your ads uh, reaching voters? 
Are they seeing your ads in the palm of their hands and only inches away from their eyes? Savio Mobile has the ability to reach voters in an unprecedented way by using machine learning to analyze data and identify voters, by creating custom ads that are interactive, that they can touch and feel and move and shake, and by delivering those ads on thousands of apps and websites of premium inventory. App Science is our proprietary technology. It's a machine learning tool that analyzes data to identify voters. App Science identifies voters based on data from over 250 million mobile devices around the country. Two of the data points, the data signals that I want to focus on are app profiles and location data. App profiles are the apps that all of us download on our device. Combined with location data, it gives us an enormous amount of, of, uh, of data and understanding of voters' preferences, uh, what their likes are, where they invest their time. And here are a few examples of how that works. So a campaign is trying to reach a conservative parent with a national security message. App Science identifies this conservative mother based on the apps she has on her device and the location data that App Science is gathering. We then deliver a, the campaign's national security ad, and we add captioning to the video so that she's able to watch that video even if her phone is turned off. I mean, the volume is turned off. Another example is a campaign that wants to get out the vote with progressive college students. So App Science identifies this student based on the apps, and by geofencing college campuses and universities, App Science identifies this voter, and we deliver a, the campaign's video, but we add haptic to that, to that video, which means that the phone vibrates. So when the, this voter is watching that video, his phone is actually vibrating, uh, and it really increases awareness. The third example is uh, a campaign that wants to remind voters to get out, to remind the base to get out and vote on election day. And so App Science identifies this voter, and we deliver this ad, uh, adding an end card at the end of the video so that when he selects the ad, so clicks on that ad, it adds uh, a reminder, an election day reminder to his phone's calendar. In summary, Sabio can help you reach voters in an unprecedented way by using machine learning by creating custom ads and by delivering those ads on thousands of mobile apps and websites. We work with some of the world's largest brands and agencies, and we know what works best with mobile, and we want to help you uh, use mobile to your advantage as well. Thank you. Of course. Michelle, you start. Thanks, Becky. Uh, what about all the purported conservatives and evangelicals that are stealth using Tinder? You know, how do you <laughs> how do you how do you know you're really reaching a? Are you been keeping? No, I'm just conservative. I've, I've been looking at your phone. <laughs> well, well, well. Again, I think that what's interesting about that question is, for example, Nielsen data, right? Survey data. It's one thing if you ask me what I think or what I believe in, and it's another thing for us to observe data that maybe you're not telling anyone else. And so by using our technology, we are truly identifying audiences based on their app profile, where they go, where they invest their time, and the kinds of apps that they download that they may not want anyone else to know. Is there an opt-out of it? I mean, like, I, I have, I'm totally comfortable with all my apps, but, but is there, is there, I mean, in, in this new data Cambridge Analytics sure. Sure. Thing, Analytica thing. I mean, it's a little uncomfortable to think that I'm going to be targeted because I have some weird apps on my phone. So, Yeah, yeah no, I, I completely agree, and I think that's a great question because we use non-PII data. In fact, strictly, um, any, for example, a voter po profile, a voter registration file, right? We ask that we purge all the personal data. I don't want an address, phone number. I don't want any of that data. All I want is a device ID. So I'm not targeting personal data. I'm using uh, device, device IDs. And I think that, again, there's that balance when we download apps, when we're using things that are free, um, we're kind of giving up some of, some of that. OK, right. Joe, you got to make this clear. Do you have a database that people come to you and say, you provide the data? Or are you relying on the campaign to give you data and then you use their data to make all the magic happen? It, it's both. So we have our own data. It's and first how much party do you data. have? We, on over 250 million devices in the country. And so right, it's right, right. all our own first party data. Right. Uh, 
and, and at the same time, if a campaign comes to us with a voter registration file, typically we'll use a third party like LiveRamp. They give the file to LiveRamp. Right. LiveRamp, all we want is the device ID, yeah. okay. so we don't use any personal data. Okay. I knew that was coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Mueller will be contacting you a bit later. Um, next up, learn about a state-of-the-art way to, oh, no, that's, yeah. Learn about a state-of-the-art way to optimize your media by modeling the factors that can influence a voter with our next presenter. Please welcome Michelle Campbell. Good afternoon, everybody. So imagine modeling all of the factors that affect the mind of a voter. It's a pretty complicated business that we've been in since 2016. So who are we? We're Market Predict. We're live predictive modeling that delivers smart campaigns and we convert voters in real time to win elections. So how do we do it? We have a few value propositions that we focus on. One of them being voter, instead of really focusing on voter reach, we're focusing on voter conversion. So what voter conversion means is, is that we are looking at people in real time using not only live data, but machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we're running the model millions of times between now through the general election to create our data. We also are omni-channel, so we are helping deliver smart campaigns by looking at digital, cable, t broadcast television um, recommendations so that you are really making sure that your media is going to work for you. What's really interesting too, unlike other data companies, is we're also very nimble and customizable. So we're able to ingest your proprietary data on top of all of ours to make sure that we're working specifically for your campaign. So in the end, when you combine all of this together, what we're trying to do is help you know when and where and how to pivot for your campaign in real time. So when you look at optimizing your media, what are the data inputs that really matter? So we are an agent-based modeling platform that ingests over 17 different data inputs, which is the largest in the marketplace. We look at paid, earned, and social media, and we're really tracking word of mouth in real time, which we really know is affecting voters and how they're voting on election day. From an earned standpoint, we also look at TV mentions, candidate debates, what's happening, happening with topical tracking. And from a paid standpoint, we're obviously ingesting all the paid data from what's being spent on TV, mobile, desktop, digital, cable, radio. In addition, the other data points that we're really looking at that make us different is voter turnout as well as live events. So what's near and dear to our hearts right now are school shootings. How does that really impact the minds of the voter and the issues that they're going to go with on election day? Uh, 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 machine learning, is that another word for algorithm? As, I feel like that's a new, is that that's the second time? Machine it's learning is really yeah. just artificial okay. intelligence, yeah. so we're ingesting our own data, but we're running the model millions of times to make it okay. smarter over what is, time. What does something like this cost and, who, and who's purchasing it? For, sure. I mean, who's actually in the campaign ecosystem, who's purchasing it? Sure, so we're working directly with, we've been working with advertising agencies since 2016. We can work with party committees and issues and campaigns or candidates direct as well. So since 2016, we've worked on 14 races, and in those 14 races, we've done predictive modeling correctly and everything. But, but is it coming from the digital consultant? Is it coming from 
a general consultant? I mean, who's, who in those campaigns are who like, hires who you? Who hires yeah, you? Actually? So who hires us is anyone who's interested in optimizing media. So where our strength really is at this point is broadcast TV and cable, but we can also ingest proprietary data for digital as well as radio, or even if you want to know what you're doing from a grassroots effort from a campaign, we can also look at that as well. You didn't finish your, your um, remark. You were in how many races in 2016, and how many did you win or forecast? Well, correctly? we were in 14 races, Senate um, as well as presidential and then gubernatorial last year in Virginia, and we forecasted 13 out of the 14 races correctly. The only one that we missed was um, Trump in Wisconsin. We guessed Trump correctly or predicted Trump, but we just missed it by the margin. That was pretty good. Pretty impressive. How are you crawling all that data in real time, especially the earned media data? Sure. So we have over 17 different data inputs, and then we have live data scientists that are ingesting. But in addition to that, one of our value propositions is that we have voter panels in each of the key states where we are uh, monitoring races. So in real time, we're asking our panels, which are made up of TV viewers and entertainment viewers, political questions about what do you think of the character of this candidate? Do you live in rural Colorado and will that sway how you vote? So the voter sentiment is really important as part of real time as well as monitoring social media. And is it charged on a CPM basis? Or? Flat fee. Flat fee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Believe it or not, we're on our last presenter. Uh, <clears throat> learn about the only tool in politics to track political creative in real time, telling you exactly what ads your opponents and super PACs are airing. Please welcome Kyle Roberts. Don't be put off by that sweet little face. Yeah, right. <laughs> my mom there. Ooh. Burn. All right, you ready? So Admo is the product I'd like to talk about. It's the, uh, it's the fastest real-time ad tracking software built for modern campaigns. Here's the situation I've set up. You're a campaign manager in charge of a highly competitive house or Senate race, or you're a general consultant with, and you have lots of campaigns and you're going to cover multiple races and multiple media markets. So you want to know, where are these candidates running? Do these candidates have super PACs while others do not? What issues are they running on? And um, what issues are they talking about? How are you really going to dissect the opposition's media campaign? What will you tell donors? What will you tell your candidate? What will you tell your clients? What you need is ADMO. It's the only real-time tracking, uh, ad tracking software in politics. And what do I mean by that? It all starts with an ad alert that's built for your mobile device, your tablet, or your desktop. There's your inbox right there. There's your ad. Comes through, emailed through. That ad was detected yesterday on WTIE in the Pittsburgh market at about 6.50, 6.25 in the morning. It was in your inbox by 9 o'clock. This ad just came through yesterday, too. It's in, uh, in a race down in uh, Alabama. It was detected at 1.25 p.m. It was in your inbox by 1.30. You simply click on the ads. You get to a landing page. You can play the ads. It's a simple uh, player that works across all devices. You don't have to download any files. All the content streams in high def. You click, and you get access to your dashboard. Now you're looking at all the ads that are available in a single race. I can simply pick, oh, I want to see the ads over the last seven days, or I can look at ads over the last 30 days. I can filter to a specific election. I'm going to filter to the Michigan governor primary right now. I click on that. It's going to show me all seven ads that are currently on air that have aired within the last hour in the Michigan governor's primary. <laughs> on the far right, I'll scroll over the ad. You'll see, I can see the total spend for the individual spot, how much audience it's delivered, how many spots it's delivered statewide, and how many days on air. I click on that. On the left, I can play the ad. Across the top, I can see the top line data for the ad that, uh, that has run statewide. On the bottom, I can see the individual DMAs that the ad has run in. I can see exactly where it's run, exactly how much is spent, 
exactly how many times it has aired within the last hour, and exactly how much audience it's delivered over the period of time it's been on the air. I can click Next, and I can just see how many spots have run by day, how much money has aired by day. Then I can go look at a day part analysis, and I can see exactly the times that the ad is running and how they're distributing them across the days. I can navigate back, navigate back to my home screen, and I can go back and see all seven of my ads, and I can start the process over again. Admo tracks every political ad in all 210 media markets. Our system refreshes every 60 minutes so you know when ads are running instantly. We have the only um, real-time tracking system within, with, with a 60-minute delay in data capture, and we track 1,100 broadcast stations across all 210 media markets. Thank you. Wow. How, how much? Do you have to be a rich statewide campaign to be able to afford this? Yeah. It's very inexpensive. Very inexpensive or expensive? It's inexpensive. Very inexpensive. How would you define it inexpensive? Well, how do you define expensive? <laughs> so I, I don't want to get into the particular cost, but really like for a house race, if you want to do an individual house race, we simply charge by month and we charge per race. It's about $500 a month we'll charge for that. So it's very reasonable. So if somebody just wanted to do Labor Day on, they could, they could use the system for two months? Sure. Okay. All right. That's cool. I'll make you an offer. Um, <laughs> Do you have a plan in place to come up with a, a complementary system for digital ads? Yeah. Do you want it's to hard. It's really hard. On that? It's really hard, and we're working at it. But it's very hard to do. Okay. It's very hard. Could you not do that? <laughs> <laughs> do you think you're going to be done in time for this cycle? No. Okay. No. No way. Too hard. But it's possible. And people are doing it now. We just don't think they're doing it very effectively. You know, because you saw everyone before, everything is now audience based. It's based on what's coming out of the voter file. You have to build all these profiles of individuals because everybody gets really served a unique ad. So think about it. There's lots of different profiles on voters. You have to build all those profiles and they have to get served the individual creative. And then you have to figure out exactly how many times this is running across the web. So it's a pretty complicated process. So this is, this is just a software service that you are providing. You're not providing any analysis? No. Or what you can you do that too? We can do much deeper analysis, yes. Because we're adding a lot of, I didn't get into it, but we're adding a lot of metadata to the spots. We're, we're, we're tracking, you know, positive, negative, but we're tracking actually who specifically is mentioned in the ad, and then for how many seconds is the name mentioned. So we can see, oh, maybe Trump has been mentioned for two seconds, but, you know, Don Jr. or someone else has been mentioned for eight seconds. We, we, we do attach that data. We don't put it into the, into, the, um, into the software service because it's just a lot of data. And this is just, broadca this is just broadcast, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. But you're available to tell campaign, this is a big deal, pay attention to Definitely, it. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's see. First of all, uh, let's thank our four courageous presenters. And, and our three inquiring sharks. To make the determination as to which of these is the most innovative, we have, in response to recent events, developed a hacker-proof method. It's called the applause-o-meter. <laughs> and you, sitting here in the audience, will be the judges. So, Unless you're Russian. You know, yeah, raise your hand. Okay, are we ready? Where's our applause-o-meter? Say, say one. Yeah. One. One. Okay. Self-made insights. Okay. Sabio Mobile. Market Predict. Advertising Analytics, ADMO. What, what do you think, Sharks? I think 
they were all really good. Usually when we do this, there's one company we can make fun of, but everybody has a... <laughs> but everybody had great products. I think, I think they're all wonderful. Yeah, you made this really hard for us to be snarky up here. And, and, and kudos to them for staying on time for the most part. I mean, it was, yeah. it was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, they were all good. Okay, at the, risk, and at the risk of offending someone, but based on what I heard in terms of your response, I believe our winner is ADMO. <laughs> Congratulations, Kyle. Uh, our next session will feature the practitioners and data experts who are using these innovations and others to engage voters on the one thing that matters most on election day, turning out your voters. So first of all, before I introduce David, let us again thank our panel of sharks. Good job, excellent. And let me introduce uh, our moderator for this session, David Seawright. Thank you. You guys can come on out. You want to bring your camera up now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. We're running a little late on time. So rather than doing formal introductions of everyone just having them all, come up and join me here. And we'll do very brief introductions from our panel members before, before we get started. So as they get seated, We'll start with you, Ellen. Can you just briefly introduce yourself, tell us who you are and where you work? Yep. Hi, I'm Ellen Breedenketter. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the RNC. Hi, I'm Brian Gerner. I'm CEO of Resonate. I'm Amit Mishri. I'm the Data and Analytics Director at NextGen America. I'm Jenny Mayhew. I'm the Data and Analytics Director at NEA. Uh, can you guys hear us out there? Are they mics? Yes. Okay. Okay. Only her mics. How about you heard Ellen? Yeah. Let's try it again. Are we Let's good? Works. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> I'm Brian Gernard. I'm CEO of Resonate. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm Amit Mystery. I'm the Data and Analytics Director at NextGen America. And can you hear? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny Mayhew, uh, Data and Analytics Director at the National Education Association. Excellent. Thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I, I'm going to start with a bit of a hypothesis that I'd like you guys to be able to respond to. The hypothesis is this, in the world of targeting and turnout, we are all using the same data. We have the same voter files, we match it up against the same commercially available data, we are running, we're training similar models, so are we not just producing the same, the same results on both sides of the aisle? So the first question is, do you guys think that this is happening? And if so, what are you doing at your organization to, to produce a distinct product that can help you win elections? Start with you, Ellen. Sure. Um, so luckily at the RNC, we have had over the last couple cycles, we have had chairman, both Chairman Priebus and then Chairman McDaniel, who have believed not just in the value of analytics and data, but in investing heavily in analytics and data. And so one of the things that because of that investment, we've been able to do is, and to put it in context, over the last, I think it's six years, We've invested over $200 million in data, technology, and digital innovations. And so, yes, to some extent, there is a level of similarity in that we all theoretically get our voter files from the same boards of elections, the same secretaries of state, we buy our consumer data from the same companies. And that's true on the Democrat side, on the Republican side, across different competitors on both sides. However, one of the things that, because of this investment that you know, the, the chairman of the RNC have made, and because of this investment the RNC as a whole has made, we've been able to develop just a very, very robust repository of data. And we've been doing, you know, constantly retraining scores, constantly rebuilding files, because what everyone forgets is one of the big differentiations between good, bad data is how recent it is and how much money you're willing to invest in purchasing, acquiring, training, and hiring staff. And so because of this investment, we have been able to develop a repository of data that you know, we are retraining scores on a constant basis, whether it's the on year, the off year, December of you know, 2018, we'll still be doing this. And so we're able to really track how voters are moving, what issues move them, what changes their vote, what makes them turn out, what, what makes them cast an absentee ballot, and what makes them tick, essentially. Brian, do you? To answer your question succinctly, yes. 
I think most companies are using voter files and some basic data that they can buy from Axiom or, or other places that they're then appending and trying to come up with consumer profiles. Um, I think one of the things that Ellen said is very true, which is it's expensive not to do it that way. So um, for us, we started 10 years ago with the premises that this, the day that we need doesn't exist. So for the last 10 years, we've been building our own understanding of voters uh, across two, 200 million plus people and half a billion devices that of course we layer in the voter file and things that are relevant, but we took the, the tack that the data that you need doesn't exist and therefore we're going to curate and get that data and then leverage our own kind of technology and, te and techniques against that. So, but I think for the most part, part yes, it's, it's people are using the same data. It's expensive. I mean, as you pointed out, it's, we spend hundreds of millions as well just building our platform and our data sources. Yeah, and I would agree. I think the, what we're doing is we're, it, we're focusing on what we're adding to the voter files. So um, cell phones and emails that we can get, nothing that like we're buying illegally from Cambridge Analytica, just like things that we're getting from the voters that we're talking to. And at NextGen, we focus on college age kids a lot. So we basically are making our own voter file because they move all the time. They don't know what dorm they're in. The addresses are so wrong. Um, so but, like the general voter file stuff, I think it is pretty similar across both sides. Yeah, I would definitely echo that, that sentiment. I would say from my part as part of, as a member organization, the things that are incredibly valuable, the things that we're not buying, right? It's the transactional data that we're tracking with our membership. It's the infrastructure that we built out to track those interactions. So that's really where our focus has been, less so on acquiring the data. We've gotten pretty good at that. We all work off of the same files. We all use the same methods. But what sets the NEA apart or any membership organization is the interaction data that we're having with our members. Great. So it seems like we all kind of agree with this premise, and we all talk about how it's important for our organizations to be generating new data, acquiring new data, creating new data. So uh, if you can offer some more specifics, what is it that you are trying to go create? What data, to your point, the data that we need does not exist. Yeah. So we'll start with you, Brian. What sure. is the data that you need to create because it does not yet exist, and what is the strategic value for practitioners like these people here who are trying to win elections? Sure, so, so I think um, Ellen also mentioned recency. So the thing that we looked at as we started the company 10 years ago was we looked at, you have to go beyond partisanship. You gotta understand kind of the voter and their mentality as an individual. And how do you understand that person and why they're going to make a decision to support a, a candidate or a cause? And we started that with a methodology that we maintain a, a database of 200,000 people that we spend 40 minutes with and ask them very detailed questions. But, but that's just the start of understanding the voter landscape. In addition to that, we, we have a behavioral data stream that um, we enrich by understanding every word that people are reading. So we see almost half a trillion data points a month, and then we build out a, a software platform and data science team to actually understand and make a, a prediction on who these individuals are and what are the things that are gonna motivate them. And then we can, I think the one unique thing we really have is that we can also then test how accurate our data is with people that we didn't necessarily ask the questions, but we can actually use that data to validate how accurate is this person likely to vote based on um, supporting the military or some social cause. I mean, what about you? Um, similar to like what you're saying, we're, we're caring about uh, where people are getting their information. So we're focused on millennials, but not all of them are using Facebook, not all of them are using Snapchat. Um, so figuring out where people are getting their news, uh, what they respond to, how, they think about things, like some of the attitudinal stuff that's not, that goes beyond partisanship and vote history. Jenny? Yeah, in addition to what Mitch just said, I would also say the f people that aren't on the voter file, people that are coming onto the voter file, how are we making sure that our infrastructure is in place so that someone goes from registering to into a database to scored to then put into one of the communication streams that we're utilizing? And again, I'll harp on like building out the infrastructure to make that a uh, usable and like doable process. Ellen, what do you think? Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. I would say, you know, we, to, to Jenny's point, you know, we obviously focus on, to some extent, voter registration, voter engagement, but, but also to, to Brian's point, a lot of what we do and a lot of what is kind of interesting and new, you know, particularly when, you know, we are the Republican Party and we do have the White House is focusing on these various legislative issues. So, you know, tracking support for tax reform, how that's moving, how that is changing, whether that motivates people to vote. Um, you know, over the last couple weeks, we've seen, you know, a lot of improvement in those numbers, which is great. And so we'll, we'll take that, figure out what's causing it, take a look at, take a look at the messaging. 
and you know, we'll track essentially you know, what is going to make people turn out to vote in November, what motivates them to go and cast a vote for Republicans, what motivates them to you know, cast their ballot early, what candidates they're going to specifically support, and really just having a full picture of what each of those voters cares about. So we've talked a lot about infrastructure, we've talked about data, we've talked about acquiring or creating new data. Does this mean that we feel as an industry and at our organizations that we are good at targeting? Um, and if we are, have we kind of maximized the value of what we can do with, with what we have, or is there, is there room to get even better? Jenny, I'll start with you. Uh, so I would say that, that a lot of missteps have been in, in a failure of imagination of assuming that we have everything and that we have everything figured out, and that in especially the political space that we've kind of, like, like we said with your first question, well, we're all using the same data, we're all training models the same way, we're all de deploying them. So a, a big part of it has to be checking your assumptions and making sure that you're validating your models with what you're seeing out in the field. And if it doesn't jive having a conversation with, with your, your campaign team to see what's going on, what, what are you hearing at the doors versus what the model is saying. And so I think it's a constant, there's never, we're never gonna reach a point where we're gonna have solved everything with data, sorry everyone. <laughs> like, we're still gonna have to knock on doors, we're still gonna have to go register voters, we're still gonna have to place value in, for me, for our, the role that our members play in the political and organizing process. Uh, no number can replace that. We're gonna continue to get better and push for it, but the, the hard work still has to be done. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, there's still a lot that can be done. A lot of it is like, we don't know what we don't know, so we've got, at least on our side, we've seen a lot of people coming in from like Silicon Valley and all that who are like, why are you doing this way? And it's like, oh, because we've always done it that way, and that's stupid, there's a better way. Um, I think there's also, people are sometimes set in their beliefs, and so it's like, oh, we, we're gonna do it this way because that's what worked in the past, and the electorate is changing, the tools that we have are changing, so we're always trying to innovate and could we like go beyond what we already know. A, a quick follow-up to that. All of us who work in politics professionally, we often will have people from outside of politics come and say, why do you do it this way, do it differently. Are there areas where you would say, no, we've always done it this way, and it's actually right, and you, Silicon Valley, are wrong. Yeah, um, I've had a lot of those conversations, but it's also, like, some of it's because of, like, infrastructure problems, right? Like, it would take too much time to build something correctly, so let's use a janky thing we have and work around it to get what we need. Yeah, I would, I would definitely echo that sentiment. I think, you know, obviously we can always learn from Silicon Valley, learn from various technology practitioners, not just there, but, you know, across the country that aren't political, but, I do think that there are certain very unique problems that we have in politics. You know, the first question was, aren't we all using the same voter files? Yes, I, I don't know how many of you guys have ever looked at a raw voter file or requested a voter file from a state board of elections, but one of the biggest things that we have to explain to people who don't have political experience is how that works. And they're like, well, why on earth do you do it that way? It's like, well, because Janet in the county clerk's office who only works three days a week and mails us this voter file on a CD-ROM, sometimes it breaks, we gotta ask her to bubble wrap it. And so there's a lot of that practical knowledge that I, I always wanna make sure we're not discounting the knowledge of people who have been doing political data for years and years and years. And you know, at the RNC, we've luckily had a very consistent political data operation, and so I never want to be discounting that experience because at least from my perspective, I think it holds a lot of value. You know, one of the people I talk to most often is, is a consultant who, of ours who's been doing this for 25 years. And he brings a lot of value to the table because of that expertise of the specifics of political data. Now, you know, if I'm looking to build out a new infrastructure, you know, I, yeah, I'm probably looking for an expert in that specific technology, but I just think, you know, we always have run into problems when we discount that historical knowledge that people bring to the table. To, to add on to that a little bit, and I'll talk about where we are from a targeting perspective. So, so my background really is, is in building technology companies. So my, my background wasn't politics until 10 years ago until I was introduced to politics through a couple of our co-founders and we really started to learn about what is nuanced and different. And what I would say is um, Sil Silicon Valley doesn't necessarily understand the problem. They understand technology, but to your point, it's about how do you apply the problem with technology. And, and to do that, you need to understand both sides. So um, as far as where we are from a technology, I mean, from a targeting perspective, I think we're still early. I think we're really early. And I don't mean, I don't mean just like resonate, I'm talking about the entire industry. And, and we're discovering new things about people and about how to actually target better. So, and just a, a good example, in, 
in a, in a recent election, uh, the special election in Alabama, we started to identify people that only consume news, very conservative side news or very liberal side of the kind of the spectrum, and they were living in these media bubbles. And we could identify those people that weren't getting a balanced kind of view of what the issues were. And we were able to expose them. And I think what's more powerful is just not just exposing them, but we actually saw a change in about 50% of those people and where they started to consume news. So they were getting a more balanced approach to kind of what they were consuming. And that, that's something that, one, wasn't possible three or four years ago and, and wasn't even a concept that someone would actually try. So we've talked a lot about targeting. This panel's called Targeting and Turnout. So let's talk about the next piece of this. How do we as an industry and how do each of you at your individual organizations connect the targeting aspect that we've talked about and all of the challenges that come with it, how do you connect it to voter contact in order to meaningfully change the turnout and the, the, the electorate and then therefore the outcome of elections? Ellen, I'll start with you. So, you know, at the RNC, one of our biggest focuses is on what we would call our permanent ground game. So making sure there are constantly RNC staff, RNC uh, organizers out in the field talking to voters and engaging with those voters. And one of the sort of underpinnings of everything that the RNC does is that it will be data driven. And that, particularly with our field program, very much applies. And so for us, a lot of it is you know, working hand in hand with our political and field teams, figuring out how best to reach these voters, how best to engage with volunteers and you know, county precincts, uh, et cetera, leaders, how best to constantly making sure that we're engaging with these people, particularly in off years when you know there's not a candidate at the top of the ticket, you know, driving engagement. So we want to make sure we're constantly engaging with these folks on the issues that they care about, the legislation that's being passed, you know, regulations that are being rolled back that affect them, and just making sure we're always engaging with these voters in their communities, talking to them about the issues that matter to them. And so, you know, we work hand in hand with our field team to make sure that that is always driven by the data warehouse that we've built. Brian, to you. Yeah. So, so we, so first of all, we work with a lot of organizations that leverage our data to do walk lists and things like that as far as enhancing what they do. Um, I think that the, the couple things that we look to is when we look at the modeling and we look at the predictions of who is going to turn out and what's the turnout going to look like and who's going to win, that's kind of how we judge how well we actually knew the voter landscape. And, and because we have built a platform that actually remodels on a daily basis as they bring in data, you can start to see shifts in what is the predicted out, output, out, who's going to show up to vote and how are they going to vote? And you know, in 2016, we the platform predicted that Trump was going to win, but six days before the election, and we saw states move um, as we got close to the election. So it's really about those types of things in, in understanding, you know, what the model is telling us. And and I would tell you too that the the idea of just using kind of high voter turnout for this election is going to be a, a mistake if that's all you're looking for, because a lot of people are going to come out to vote that don't vote very often or haven't voted at all just based on this, this year's election cycle? Uh, we are, you know, we want to talk to voters about what they care about. So, you know, obviously for young people, cost of college is high, affordable health care, gun safety. So it's making sure that the message that we're hitting them with matches what they care about. Um, and so it's always, we're constantly surveying these people all the time. Um, it's a little bit ridiculous. Uh, and just knowing that, like, we're trying to tailor things to the individual as best we can instead of just doing some broad-based thing and one message fits all. Yeah, and kind of unique to um, the National Education Association is just how terrific our members are at being spokespeople and out in their communities and kind of usually, utilizing relational organizing to talk about the importance of elections and leveraging those connections that they have in the community to make sure that folks are registered to vote, that, they're ha that they, they're getting the right kind of issue delivered to them and that kind of thing. And we can kind of use them as the messengers and they're very credible as you might imagine. Teachers are pretty great and, so, and a lot of people are willing to open the door to that, that conversation. So all of us here um, are in the business of winning elections or trying to help people win elections. Um, so for all of our talk about smart things that we're doing, what is, what is the actual impact? What sort of impact can a, a very smart and sophisticated targeting and turnout campaign have on the outcome of the election? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, I know I'm a data person, so I'm supposed to say data is the most important thing, but I think at the end of the day, candidates ultimately are what matter. 
Um, I used to work for someone who always used the metaphor, you know, candidates are touchdowns, a campaign operation is a field goal. And so a good data operation is what can put you over the edge, but ultimately the most important thing in any given race are the candidates in that race. Yeah, I, I don't, it's hard to overcome a bad candidate. Um, but I think if you can reach the right people with the candidate's message and what they, what they believe in and what, they're stand, what they stand for, and you can do it in a way that it connects the voter to the candidate, and that's really where the data and the targeting and everything else really comes together. And, and if you can do that in a way that resonates, um, uh, it, it's, you're more likely to win. I actually feel like a lot of what we do doesn't matter, and maybe that's because I've just gotten jaded. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think it's, to your point, like being efficient about the people that we're talking to so we're not turning out people who are against or who vote against our candidate or vote against our issue. Um, with everything I've done, you know, like turnout has an impact, but it's at the margins. So, like if your candidate's gonna win by 10 points, a good program might get them to 11, and that doesn't really matter. Yeah, I would agree uh, with the sentiment that although this is a data-heavy panel, like it's not a problem that like we're not going to math our way there, right? Like people are going to feel connected to the candidate, the message is going to resonate. We've seen it happen in a couple of elections recently, um, and I think that kind of harnessing those those important uh, aspects of a campaign, and then again using the data or targeting or fine-tuning to get you a little bit more at the margins. So as we're getting close to our time limit here, uh, the last question for each of you is. Um, at your respective organizations, um, what is one tangible way that you think you will be better in 2018 than you were in 2016? Start with you. So I think for us, you know, one of my main focuses when I started this job was taking the sort of national scale data operation that we had worked, you know, in conjunction with the presidential campaign last cycle and scaling it down to Senate races, to House campaigns, but well beyond that, to state House and Senate caucuses, to individual state ledge races, to you know, different Supreme Court races in various states, to city council races, to you know, all the way up and down the ballot. And so you know, for us, it, success is making sure that more of these campaigns up and down the ballot have access to the resources that we have invested so heavily in to help them win their campaigns. Yeah, so, so for us, I think we, we, um, we've gotten to a point where we can really understand at a hyper-geolocation kind of a footprint, um, the understanding not just of the people and the voters and the issues that they care about, but the, the changes in the behavioral patterns, the changes in contextually what they're reading, what they're engaged in, and being able to look at that on, on a, basically a real-time basis and, and make an even better understanding of how are they moving as voters? Who are they, who are they most likely to support? And, and how, how quickly is that changing? I actually feel like my job's gonna be pretty easy this year. Um, like, I feel like for me and Jenny, 2018 is gonna be like what was for 2014 for you guys, um, where like we can totally screw up and we'll still win a little bit. Um, you know, I think for you us- You heard it here <laughs> first. <laughs> um, it'll be the first time I've won anything. Um, you know, It'll be really, I mean, not motivating 18 or 35 year olds is always really hard, um, but for us it's a little bit easier. We just tell them that Black Panther 2 is coming out on November 6th at their polling place. Uh, <laughs> we just want every black and brown person to vote. I don't know if that's the same for everyone else up here, but that's what, we're, we're, that's what our message is going to be. So as, as a follow-up question, if you think it's going to be easy to win, do you think that there will be, on the operative side, is there a, a risk of a, a cultural challenge where people aren't gonna put in the work because they're expecting a wave anyway. No, um, I mean, we thought we were gonna win in 16 and in 14 and 10, so unless someone is just taking it for granted, we're still gonna put in work. So do you feel more confident about 18 than you did about 16? No, I don't know what to trust anymore. <laughs> I'll be honest, like, in 2017, we were watching the Virginia results come in, and I'm from the D.C. area, and someone told me that Northam won Loudoun by 20, and I was like, you mean 20 votes? <laughs> I was like, this can't, we, we don't get to have nice things. Um, so yeah, I'm still gonna, like, I, I don't wanna speak for Jenny, but like, I've been at the office until like 11 o'clock already. Um, so we're gonna be putting in the work. Jenny. Yeah, I think, I think that to echo, echo that point, we can't make any assumptions in any direction. I will say for us that we have invested pretty heavily in infrastructure and that puts us in a place in 2018 that, we're, that we just weren't in 2016. Um, and frankly, the quality of candidates that have come out to run, the future is female, and like, I'm just gonna hold on for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> there you go.
And we're coming in just under the wire. So thank you all for joining us. Thank all, thanks to all of you for listening. And uh, we got something else up here next. Thanks, guys. So as you're getting ready to adjourn here, just make you aware that those of you who are participating in the Choose Your Own Adventure activity this afternoon, you'll be meeting out in the foyer here. Your groups will be meeting out in the foyer. And specifically for those who are going on the Bellmead Plantation tour, that bus will be leaving precisely at 2.30. It will be at the left end of the foyer as you exit our auditorium today, so get over there as fast as you can. Thank you.